So my name is uh, Richard McCowan and I am a Circular Economy Club organiser with the um, based up in Yorkshire. And I've kindly taken over from David for today, who's unfortunately otherwise engaged. My other background is I run a consultancy called Biomark UK, looking at problem solving by looking to nature. But we're not here to talk about me. Um, we're here to talk about sustainable supply chains. So on my left, your right, we've got Harry and Darrison from the BT, who's the chief... I didn't realise there was a gap between us. I thought you were sitting there. <laughs> That's better. Who is the BT chief procurement officer in charge of a global spend of £12 billion. And on my right, we have um, Chris Webb, who's the director of climate markets at the NGO, the Nature Conservancy, who's recently joined them after 10 years in the private sector. So he's got a great experience from both the NGO and the corporate world. So one of the things we want to talk to today about is obviously, um, you know, how do we tackle supply chains mostly from the top down and the bottom up? And I'd like to start off with you, Harry, first off, is what are your key challenges at BT related to supply chain sustainability? Um, if I sort of, before I sort of answer that, I think one of the things important is, certainly in BT, is the purpose of our company. Uh, and the purpose, which is very easy for all 100,000 employees, is to use the power of communications to make a better world. That has been an anchor for us very easily to say, what does a better world mean? <laughs> it doesn't just mean sell, service our customers, obviously it does. It doesn't just mean make money for our shareholders. But actually, we come to work for more than that. And for a better world, if I just look at what it means for carbon and climate change, we decided, one of the early companies, adopters, to go for the one and a half degree challenge. And we've decided to make that work for us, our contribution to that as a corporation. We're going to reduce our carbon footprint, our carbon emissions, by 2030 by 87%. All right, 87%. It's an easy number to come up with. And then you look at how do we emit carbon? What is our footprint? Well, we found out when we did the calculations, a third of it is our own people doing things, traveling, whatever, but two-thirds of it is our supply chain. So, reality, in terms of linking the purpose to climate change, what it means supply chain, if I don't succeed with my team on this, we will miss that target. And it's a published, externally published target. That's great, thank you. Um before we go on any further, if you do have any questions, we're going to have a Q&A, but if you really have a burning desire to ask anything, please just stick your hand up and we'll try our best to answer it. But yeah, please enjoy it as we go along. Um, so next question I'd like to ask you is how do you get suppliers on board with sustainability? Well, so I said, you know, two thirds of our footprint is suppliers. When you start looking at um, the, the power that we have, but also to get these suppliers on board, how do we know what they emit? So now, big plug for Sonia and the CDP team, Sonia Bonsley, is we were one of the founder members of this CDP project, and we encourage our suppliers to sign up to that, because you have to do a lot of work down your supply chain. So we've got over 50% of our spend um, of our, from our suppliers signed up. And the other thing we've done is, that's okay, they might sign up, they might not sign up, but we might still buy goods from them. The key thing we also told them was internally, um, in terms of our adjudication, years ago we had, you know, we have naught to 100%, you know, you have 20% on is the price okay, does it do what you want, a few other T's and C's. We had 0% on sustainability. When I came in this role, we moved that up to 5%, but what we were finding on the 5% adjudication is if you had a company that was hopeless on sustainability and scored zero, one was brilliant at five, it hardly made any difference when you adjudicate. So we shifted that a few years ago to 10%. 10% of an adjudication of sustainable is pretty meaty, because between a naught and 10 could be, are you first in the adjudication or are you second? We started rejecting suppliers who had fantastic goods, at absolutely best price, did everything we wanted, but didn't have the right sustainability credentials. So the supply base started getting wind of this, and more importantly, also internally, operationally, people knew there's no point shortlisting supplies on a tender that weren't good in this because you were going to go right to the end of the process and not pick them. So that 10% is a critical thing that we can play with. Wow. What actually the practice of 
techniques do you actually use with these um, with the suppliers? Um, several things. Like I said, number one, we are constantly, what I call it, encouraging them, cajoling them, persuading them very strongly to report on CDP. Um, the other thing we have is something called the supplier assessment tool. So that this is actually not just we give it to, we assess suppliers. We sort of licensed it free. So we've given it to the Quest Forum, which is a sort of an ICT forum. So suppliers who are, you know, the kind of suppliers that we might use, mm -hmm. they can access this tool to make their own assessments, both for themselves and their supply chain. Because this is a thing where I, I see people, corporates, certainly like BT, we're at the top of the pyramid. We have to force change down the pyramid. But you can't just do that, you have to educate them. So we've been giving practical help in terms of the supply assessment tool. Okay, that's great. I mean, moving on to Chris, I mean, obviously, what is your role? Um, completely different from the, I suppose, the bottom up as a, you know, conservation NGO in this. Great, so we're here. Sorry, that was a bit loud. Everyone awake now? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we're here to talk about supply chains uh, and uh, suppliers. Um, and I'm going to start by re-emphasizing something that I think many of you heard this morning, but it absolutely warrants reinforcing. And that is the sleeping giant that nature is, is as a climate solution. So you know, we were very proud at TNC to lead to two years of scientific sort of research that showed that nature can provide up to 37% of the climate mitigation between now and 2030 by, uh, on a cost-effective basis. Um, by nature, we mean forests and agriculture, wetlands, coastal lands. Um, the 37%, I don't want you to think that's 37.000. There's some uncertainty in that. But it is much bigger than either, say, the amount of public funding, public climate funding that is out there for nature, which is about 2%, far, far less than the 37%. We also track something that we call the global climate conservation events like this, what we see in the printed and social media. And that, we think, nature gets about 1% to 3% of that conversation. So we're not talking about it enough, and we're not spending our money wisely. Uh, and and that, was, that 37% is cost effective, which is why it's wisely. Even if you are not interested in preserving nature because of the, the benefits it provides to ecosystems, to people, to biodiversity, if you're just interested in your bottom line, Nature can provide up to a third of the solution. A big uh, threat to nature is tropical deforestation. So if we look at that, about 80% of tropical deforestation is caused by agriculture. Um, and we've been working on the ground for decades in Latin America, in Indonesia, and in East Africa, working with, with farmers. But really, a couple of years ago, f f for us as an organization, we saw this huge opportunity, this sleeping giant, and we realized that our work on the ground, even if we scaled it up an order of magnitude, wasn't going to get us to the scale of change to unlock that 37%. And that really got us thinking about systems change. Uh, and that got us thinking about the supply chains. So how can we work throughout the value chain, particularly in the agriculture sector? So what is actually the system change you've been putting in place? <laughs> so I think... Uh, a good example that I wanted to share is from an area of Brazil called the Cerrado. Um, you're all probably familiar, or everyone will be familiar with the Amazon. And there's some fantastic uh, graphs that uh, I'd, I'd have loved to have shown that show satellite imagery of the evapotranspiration from the Amazon being brought over to Europe from the Gulf Stream and raining here. You know, the Amazon providing the water that gives us hydropower energy, that waters our crops and feeds us here in Europe. Now, a lot of awareness has been raised around deforestation in the Amazon over the last 20 or so years, and we've had some success in particularly slowing, if not halting, rates of deforestation there. But the Cerrado is a really critical ecosystem that may well have borne the brunt of those successes in the Amazon. It is a huge, huge area. It's about 2 million square kilometers. It's about 20% of Brazil's land mass. It is a tropical savanna. And in fact, it's the world's most biodiverse tropical savanna. So it's a really important ecosystem. But it has been, uh, the rates of deforestation there in the last 10 or so years have spiked. It's now Brazil's largest area exporting beef to the world. Um, soy is catching up quickly and other agricultural goods. If you, we also, as we started to step back and think about how do we really deliver systems change, if that's the problem, 
saw an opportunity in the deforestation-free supply chain commitments that have been made by many consumer goods companies. Um, and soy is one of those commodities that sits in those uh, commitments. And so we have been working alongside you know, many others from civil society to put together that value chain from farmers, processors, traders, consumer goods, and retailers, tracking back from the soy uh, in the Cerrado all the way through to retailers here in Europe and the US, bringing those, uh, all those different actors together to do three things. First, you know, raise awareness and, and educate. Um, secondly, create some common goals and a vision. And one of the things I want to sort of flag here is even just something as simple as the language and definitions here are not often understood across value chains. So that's been a really important part of what we've been doing, creating a common language and understanding. But the third is, is in fact the most important, which is when we have tried to tackle supply chains, you know, actually, you know, we thought we could solve this problem in the Cerrado through regulation, through policy. That's really how NGOs have been approaching this in the past. And we've realized, you know, the last 18 months, so that isn't the way. The only way we're going to do this is through aligning economic incentives. So we've been working on how do we create mechanisms that redistribute economic incentives through that value chain, um, from the retailers here all the way through to farmers in the Cerrado. There, there should be, sometime this year, a Cerrado declaration. Um, unfortunately, there's no punchline. It isn't here yet. I can't kind of show it to you. But it will be a commitment from all these actors, along with the mechanisms that are going to solve that problem of deforestation in the, in the Cerrado. No, it's really interesting. I mean, um, my background is so I used to teach landscape architecture. And having a landscape architect speaking to an engineer is very hard. It's like getting an engineer to understand about street trees. They'd rather stick in heavy infrastructure than actually something that grows and does itself. But we can pick up and then something, other discussions. So I'd like to get you guys actually talking together about, you know, obviously we've got NGOs and we've got corporates. How are they actually changing and looking at working together? And do you see a, a move to kind of this missing middle? If anyone's not heard of the missing missile, it's something that came about from a great guy who runs the Ecological Sequestration Trust called Peter Head. And it's about how top down, so corporates, policy meets with NGOs and the, the consumer to actually they come and meet the common ground when they're both actually doing and moving in the same direction. Um, so how do you actually see these um, things happening? So I think hopefully the example I gave was an example of us as an institution stepping into, the, into that missing middle. You know, one of the roles we increasingly find ourselves in is, is as a convener, somebody that can engage businesses, can engage governments and understands and can engage not just farmers on the ground, but you know, local communities and indigenous peoples. We need to be empowering all of those to work together. Uh, you know, I think one of the messages that perhaps Harry and I can kind of bat around a little bit is, is, is I think it, it's great to see companies setting, you know, there are many of you in this room that I'm sure are setting very ambitious targets. But ultimately, the kind of the climate challenge and the sustainability challenges that we face require whole systems change. And particularly when it comes to, say, the agriculture sector, you know, globally traded commodity goods, you know, one organization cannot do that alone. You, we have to work in different, more collaborative ways. And I think you know, we see our role in is in helping to bring those actors together. I think I would say some of the thought leadership we've had has come from what you call the NGO community, um, smaller organizations, uh, rather than waiting for legislation or whatever to come in. I think the, uh, the CDP is a great example. You know, it's a collection of companies that came together, but it's quite pervasive now. The other thing I would also say where it comes together is because you know, we have 17, 18,000 supplies in BT, uh, uh, billions and billions of spend. And it's not just the big ones. And you know, where if I see the NGOs coming in from bottom up is actually helping the SMEs because mm -hmm. you've got a whole bunch of people there you know, a small SME of 30, 40 people might not have a sustainability policy or a person leading that because they don't, you know, everybody's multitasking. So I think getting the information out there to the wider economy and the companies, I think NGOs play a big part because you know, I've got some very small suppliers and some very, very big ones. You know, I've got you know, FTSE under the top 10 companies in the world we might supplying me, but most of my suppliers are probably SMEs. How do I change that around? You know, I need help. So working with NGOs actually is quite critical for us to get the message and to give them practical tools on what we need to uh, make a difference on. Yeah, and that, that fits in very well, not just with um, 
Chris and you talking together, but myself as well, and other NGOs in the audience, is how do you actually deal with your you know, your carbon footprint and things like that? If anyone's interested, I looked at the life cycle of a post-it note yesterday. But it's interesting to consider that's a little things as a small company when you start tying into B Corps and things like that. How do you actually understand you're flying around the world, getting things, moving things around? It's a lot more um, important for you know the one or two people in the office or the 30, 40, whereas economies of scale, the larger companies, you can actually look at offsetting that and moving it around. I'll just, just add that um, you know, Nature Conservancy is the world's largest conservation organisation, but we're still an SME. And actually, we struggle internally with all, with all those same, same challenges that you were flagging for your supplier base. So um, if anyone's got any good solutions that can help us, we would love to kind of learn and, and benefit from those. So one of the things we, we've been talking about is, is systems and complex systems. I mean, how many people here like complex systems? <laughs> Yay, solidarity. So one of the things, obviously, if you study complex systems, whether it's in nature or, you know, artificial intelligence, data analysis, is actually unexpected results coming out, you know, emerging properties or agency. I mean, is there anything that you've actually seen yourself that have just gone, wow, we didn't set that in place, but where did that come from? Uh, I'd probably say if you're, if you're going down the sustainability, hopefully we all are, journey in a serious manner, be prepared for the unexpected. Um, give you one example on a particular battery manufacturer. You know, we have lots of buildings which we need to have backup batteries in, you know, keep our exchanges going. And we, so we had the whole journey about picking the uh, particular supplier. And great product, right price. Slightly concerned, but wasn't really sure about some of their sustainability credentials uh, on the 10%, whatever. So they seemed to be scoring okay. And, but when we onboarded them, said, right, you're in, we're going to deploy you in the BT network, we said one thing, when I was signing this off with the senior operational guys, we said, we're going to make one or two trips out there just to see how their sustainability credentials are. We've seen a paper exercise what they've done, and it's legal, and therefore you believe them. We're going to test for ourselves. When we went, and I said, but if there's some findings we're unexpected, uh, be prepared for me to act, I want you to act. We did that six months later, and we found things that were just not right. Came back, tried to coach the supplier to do things, and they weren't moving quick enough. We then, I had to set in the balloon up, told them, instigated like force majeure to get them out, told operationally you're going to have complete disruption on this, and started putting another one in. But in the meantime, we didn't give up on that supplier because they really didn't, it wasn't deliberately they were being unsustainable, they just didn't know what to do. Uh, it, was, it was incompetence rather than anything else. It took them another six to 12 months to get there. And then we brought them back in. So one of the things I think the learnings for us as unexpected, actually, I feel like when I, when, when I adjudicate and we have tenders, it's like an iron fist in a silk glove. We're shaking their hand and then squeezing them and squeezing them. You don't know what's going to happen. So my learning from that is, yes, you can't do anything but trust, because you can't go and visit every new supplier on board. It's just physically impossible. But you have to trust. But the ones you're not sure about, find a way, either you or find somebody on your behalf to go and do the tests yourself, checks yourself. So that was a bit unexpected, to be frank. Costly as well. I was going to give an, an example of an unexpected and unintended consequence. So that's the uh, sort of the other message that I think I'd like you to kind of leave with is, as you work through your supply chain, cultural norms become very different. And, and I've seen a number of examples where uh, what might seem appropriate here creates unintended consequences in the cultural circumstance, you know, far away down in your supply chain. Um, about a decade or so ago, uh, I was working with the Ethical Tea Partnership, um, working on um, auditing um, social and environmental conditions on tea, planta tea plantations in Sri Lanka. And anyway, one of the things that we found there was what seemed sensible here in the UK and Europe as a, as a policy that we would, would want you know, all of those plantations to adhere to. We found out, given the cultural circumstances, was actually disadvantaging um, the female staff there. And they were losing about 20% of their, of their salary. Um, and so you know, that, that, that is a very real unintended consequence that we've always got to be alive to. Thank you. Right, so you've heard enough from us um, and the two great panels talking about 
what they're doing. We would like to open up to the audience of any questions. I believe there's a, is there a roaming mic being passed around. Perfect. So um, if we take a couple of questions at the same time, um, got a gentleman here. Is there any other, anyone else that would like to ask a question? Oh, it's a bit shy. Thank you. Uh, Tim Crowley Martello, Low Carbon. So we have a sustainability fund in Dublin, in Ireland, and people subscribe into this based on their emissions. So in one case, it works very well where uh, they wanted to decarbonize their supply chain. So a food company invested in on-farm anaerobic digestion. So that's an example of where it worked. One where it didn't work was a smaller company who said, well, our, our supply chain, what we want to address is palm oil. And that was one where we didn't have the global reach to address that. So I just thought that might be a question for, for Chris particularly. Sorry, uh, so the question was, sorry, you maybe I didn't quite catch it up here. So, so a, a food processing company where in one instance they're concerned about on-farm emissions so we could invest in anaerobic digestion. So that worked very well. In another one, they say, well, we'd like to do something about palm oil, which is a more um, far-flung supply chain, and we didn't have the wherewithal to address that. So just if you had any ideas on that. So they're being quite, yeah, so looking at sustainable palm oil. Um, yeah. Yeah, a, a very hot topic. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so the palm oil supply chain is uh, often very complex, particularly at that processing level. Um, a lot of sustainable palm is produced, certified sustainably, but then often get, gets mixed at the mill with unsustainable um, s sourced palm oil. Um, that situation is improving um, and so more segregated supply chains do exist. I think what I would say is that in the last probably 12 or 18 months there's been some fantastic kind of free um, tools that are now out there that are really starting to shine a light and bring some transparency to a lot of these supply chains. One of them is called Trace, T-R-A-C-S-E, uh, and it maps uh, commodity flows using import-export dockets. It's done a huge sort of AI data analytics uh, uh, sort of process. Um, and that, that now uh, starts to provide you know, understanding of where that's coming from. Something called Global Forest Watch then enables you to look at deforestation and other sustainability risks mapped out along the world. So you could now, prob probably now, and you maybe probably couldn't do this 12 months ago, understand you know, where your organization is, where might your palm oil be coming from, and what are the risks on the ground that that source of supply might, might be facing. S certainly, yes. Um, there, are, um, there are some funds that you could invest into. So there are some intermediary asset managers that are seeing opportunities to make you know, market returns from sustainable palm oil. Um, and there are opportunities to ex um, invest directly. I'll happily chat to you afterwards if that's helpful. I mean, is this something that's um, tied into BT with sustainable palm oil? Is there other examples you can give to her? Not, not palm oil. We're not uh, big consumers of that, but. I mean, I would say, I, I mean, last year I was, sorry, to, is um, Western Foods do a lot of work, and I, I believe that they've just done a report on sustainable palm oil, and I can introduce you to their head of um, sustainability on that, so the Dutch company. Great, so um, thank you. Um, any other questions? Anyone? Thank you, gentlemen over here. Hi, so it's Matt Scott here from UL. Um, it's probably a question for uh, Harry, I guess. It's about the CDP process, and I guess getting data from the larger businesses. How do you find sort of the long tail, you know, get, getting into the smaller companies and actually gathering scope one and two data from those companies? It, it, it's a good point. So we are, we are currently through 50% of our spend, like I said, which is 
dominated by the bigger ones. Uh, but what we're, f we're finding two things. One, um, our, our tail and our supplier's tails, if you like. So when you have a big supplier, and they might have 5,000 suppliers underneath them, when we force them to sign up, um, and they're coming back to us on their carbon reporting, they're having to go around their supply chain. So number one, um, you, you sort of like become a force for good because the top of the pyramid just forces uh, this carbon reporting. What we are finding also in the supplier assessment tool, you know, it gives a, a reasonable amount of um, information that they need to ask themselves. So for the SMEs and the smaller suppliers, it, they need to start the journey. And so to expect all of the 17,000 suppliers I have to be on CDP reporting is probably unrealistic at day one. But the fact that when you onboard a new supply, you go through this process, you ask them the same questions, means they start to think about this. They're, they've started the journey. We want to be a supplier to BT. If you go to our external facing website, it says selling to BT. You know, it's our procurement homepage. There it tells you, if you want to be a supplier, here are the things you need to consider. We have a copy of the supplier assessment tool. You go there and say, I'm going to be measured on these things. You know, and we ask you to fill it in before you become a supplier. So some of this will be a journey, and it's going to be a multi-year journey, especially for the smaller SME suppliers. And we're realistic about that. If there's any comfort to us, the much smaller suppliers, their carbon footprint on our behalf is much smaller, but that doesn't mean we're ignoring it. So we've sort of stopped it getting any worse because of the new stuff have to go through the process. Then we're working our way down the tail on the existing suppliers, saying this is now important. Because when we onboarded them, I don't know, 15 years ago, this wasn't on the agenda. We didn't ask them to do this, to be fair to them. Does that make sense? Great, thank you. Is there um, time for one more quick question? Will we sum up? Yes, lady at the front. Hi there, I'm Laura Simmons. I work for Intercontinental Hotels Group. Um, I'm just keen to know when you're um, working with suppliers and if they don't meet your criteria, for example, and then it gets to the point where you have to make the tough call to exit that supplier, how do you navigate that conversation with the business? Great question. Um, and I think well, you, you've got almost three communities of interest here to make that happen. And, and it's, it's partly facts, but partly EQ. So you've got my team, and they have to believe this, they must want this, they must know how to use this, the tools are, are available. You've got the supply base who you need to educate to say, this is really important, don't bother bidding to BT unless you're strong in this. And then you've got the operational teams who, are, to be frank, they might play lip service to this because they want the best product and they've got budgets and they've got to be within the budget, so they want the most that they can get. Putting these three together, I keep saying to us, you know, we're like marriage counselors, bringing all this together. Uh, and it, number one is education. Uh, you have to educate the suppliers to say, and again, we do it externally on our websites, we do them when we try and onboard them, and the tender process to say, these are important things. You have to constantly educate the operational teams. And it took a lot of work internally to make the 5%, 10%. Because operational teams are saying, what? I've got this thing, it's half the price, and you're telling me I can't have it because they're not green? What are you on about? Not doing it. So across the company, we had to communicate, I'm taking it to five to 10, and it's real. And it means if something, someone is 75%, another one's 80%, and it was to do with the 10%, you're not gonna get your supplier. That take, that's, sounds easy, that's taken years, but because now we don't bother putting the ones we think they're gonna fail on that on the tender list. So what sounds today, oh, that's really easy, you've got everybody lined up, was years of naught to five to 10% on the adjudication. Keep educating your suppliers, and most importantly, work at your operational colleagues to say, this is happening, this is real. And if you don't believe me, go look at our purpose. It says to use the power of communications to make a better world. If you've got problems with me, go and speak to the CEO. That's great, thank you, Harry. Um, now, just to summary up um, very briefly, and um, we've heard from two differing camps. Now, one of the areas that seems to really come up is joining for it. It's not about tools, it's not about you know, engineering, it's not about data, it's about people. And we've heard about, you know, it's about the power of change in people and getting people to actually understand and change for, you know, Harry's um, examples of actually taking leadership with um, the suppliers when they're 
delivering things that are excellent, but also the ones that need to, you know, a bit of a leg up. The same with Chris's work, actually, when he's, you know, they're going into different countries and regions around the world. And we've heard about very much about the hard targets moving from a 5% to 10%, about how BT is actually leading for the front. But I think the guys at Nature Conservancy are also doing that as well. But you guys are also looking at different ways, looking, jumping in, looking at the nature and how the natural world can actually push it forward. And the final thing we started talking about is it's about systems change and actually just embracing that, letting kind of looking at where we're seeing kind of you know unexpected results coming out. But one of the things I'd like to um, end with is what should um, the audience members take away? What one thing can they take away from the, today's talk that they can go and um, implement in their business um, after the summer ends? I think the supply chain absolutely can be a force for good. So whether you're an NGO, you're an SME, or a big corporate force this agenda because it's also actually good for business. You know, our customers are saying in our bids, are you ethical, are you responsible? We want our suppliers to be. So this is a virtuous circle. This is, uh, this is only going in one direction. Uh, and we have to fill bid templates for customers. And if you don't have these credentials, they no bid. We're doing the same for our suppliers. This is going nowhere. Thank you. OK, last, last word for me. Um, it's raise your ambition. The challenges we face are so huge. This needs to be about taking leadership positions. It isn't just my company is going to lead for what we do. It's that how do I get our sector to lead? You're going to need to work together in very different ways. Because if you succeed, but we ultimately fail, then we've all failed. I'd like to finish with, yeah, I saw somebody in the, somebody, a sticker on somebody's computer on the way down, and it says, it's time, not time to innovate, it's time to get shit done. I think that sums up what we need to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>